Okay, so I'm going to uh, switch over to screen share, and uh, we'll go from there. I'm sorry about the technical issues. This just happens sometimes. Okay, so I'm not going to have my picture on here this time. I'm just going to... I'm just going to share my PowerPoint. Okay, give me just a moment. Get to my PowerPoint. So you see the PowerPoint, yes? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so... A few weeks ago, your professor and I started talking about um, our mutual interests. Uh, our mutual interests when we were at a um, a uh, conference together, and uh, we were talking about what we teach uh, separately. And my topic is why good leadership in business is bad leadership for government. And a little bit of my background um, is probably important here because uh, just to give you a sense of uh, what I'm about, where how I came to what I'm talking about. Uh, my PhD is in organizational leadership from Regent University. My dissertation was the leadership assumptions of American statesmen during the Constitutional Convention and ratification debates. And so I've been interested in, uh, when I was in my PhD program studying leadership, I was trying to understand um, the largest, most long-lasting organization I could think of, the U federal government, and what did the founding fathers think as they were putting the federal government together? What what was in their minds? What were their assumptions? Um, I uh, taught at Liberty University for six years. I uh, then moved down here to Charleston Southern, uh, and I've been here as the as a professor and the director of the MBA program since then. My research agenda has been leadership and leadership development, and so I, what I've been uh, doing is is really looking at leadership. But in my dissertation, I really looked at a different aspect of it, and this is what applies to you uh, where you are right now. So my questions are these. What is leadership according to the modern business literature? Then how did the founding fathers view leadership? And if it was different, why was the founding fathers view different than the modern business leadership? And if it is different, which it is, which side is wrong? Or are there two views that are somehow compatible in one way or another? So my first question is, what is leadership? And when we look at what is leadership, elements of leadership include things like vision, a shared vision, sense-making, setting direction, a clear purpose, planning, a compelling future, right? These two guys were both visionary. Both Obama and Reagan are extraordinarily visionary. Now, they, their vision goes two different, very different directions, but they were very, very visionary. Um, influence. Influence is another element of leadership. It's an increment above over mechan mechanical uh, compliance. It's the true measure of leadership. It's about persuasion, not force. So when you're dealing with influence, you see things like this in Time's Most Influential People, Jay-Z and Tim Tebow. Now, neither of them can force you to do something. I suppose if, um, if Tebow got close enough, he could force you to do things. But I, in general, I mean, we're talking about influence. They, they, people want to follow them. That's leadership. Motivation is a core to leadership. Leadership is about motivating and inspiring, not controlling. Controlling is force. Leadership is about inspiring. It's a very different element. Then you have relationship and emotional connection. Relationship is important. Um, in fact, when you look at leadership, ship the suffix. Ship means connection with. That is, you're in relation to another person. So here's the other words that uh, relate to that. Apprenticeship, bipartisanship, discipleship, uh, dictatorship, leadership, partnership, relationship, stewardship, or worship, right? It means you're in a relationship with the other person or people or whatever, okay? Okay. I don't know if you know who this is. This is Herb Kelleher from Southwest Airline. Now, you know that you are leading your organization well when, you're, when your employees take out an ad like this in the paper. Thanks, Herb, for remembering every one of our names, for supporting the Ronald McDonald House, for helping load our baggage on Thanksgiving, for giving everyone a kiss, and we mean everyone, for listening, for running the only profitable major airline, for singing at our holiday party, for singing only once a year, for letting our, uh, us wear shorts and sneakers to work, for golfing at the Love Classic, for out talking Sam Donaldson, for riding your Harley Davidson to Southwest Head quarters for not just for being a friend not just a boss happy bosses day from each of your 16,000 employees now when your employees 
spend their own money to take out a, a, an ad in USA Today, a full page ad that says that you're doing something right. You have that relationship down. Change is also a part of leadership. The purpose of leadership is change. Management is about coping with complexity. Leadership is about coping with change. So if you're not moving from point A to point B, you're not actually leading. If you're doing the same thing that you did yesterday, it's not leadership. It's, it's maybe uh, running a tight ship, but it's not leadership. That's management. Then there's leading by example, um, the process of persuasion, the in the trenches effect. The first step is modeling the way, um, setting the performance high for themselves and earning credibility. Leadership by example, you see it in servant leadership when, uh, when Christ um, washes the disciples' feet and says to do this for others, he's modeling the way. That's leading by example. Um, th there's a great book called It's Your Ship by uh, Captain Abershoff, and he says a leader will never accomplish what he or she wants by ordering it done. Real leadership must be done by example, not by precept. Okay, you have to set the example. It's not by accident that the uh, Army Infantry School at Fort Benning, Georgia, that their patch for the infantry school is follow me. Right, because what do you want to do? You want to follow the guy that's going forward and saying follow me, not the general that says, you know what, guys, I'll stay back here where it's safe. You go forward. Okay, so that's leadership in the uh, in the um, uh, business literature kind of sense. Other factors include alignment and credibility and duplication, distributed leadership, empowerment, educating for character, but all of that comes down to the results of effective leadership come out to things like empowerment, teamwork, trust, ownership, effective delegation, self-managed teams. Now, again, look at the results of effective leadership, empowerment. You want to, I mean, they're empowered to go out and do as much as they can right? Now, that's the kind of organization that you want to work in. You want to be in a business like that. Now, what's different about the government? Well, in the government, we have people like mm, this, okay? So, and, you know, these are kind of shady characters that I, I'm not sure that we want to empower them to, to be as free as they can. And, you know, it's not just, uh, and these guys all happen to be in sex scandals, just, um, but it's not just that. I mean, look at recent scandals, things like um, the the uh, Internal Revenue Service, uh, what, what's been going on there with um, the Tea Party, or uh, or what happened with Benghazi, we still don't have answers yet, or the chief of NSA lying to us about what data is being collected about all of us, or the IRS scandal, um, and uh, uh, what's been going on there. In fact, the, the new IRS scandal, not the for first one, is that they're paying out uh, $70 million in employee bonuses. Uh, the, uh, the whole um, uh, Holder probe where, uh, you know, he's... Oh, he's been in a number of things. Let me just say that William Jefferson Clinton, uh, or not Clinton, William Jefferson was sentenced to prison. He had uh, uh, cash in his freezer at his house because he was taking bribes. Uh, if you roll back the clock into the Bush administration, it's not just uh, the the current administration. You see Attorney General Gonzalez firing a bunch of attorney generals, or uh, we can't forget Richard Nixon. Uh, corruption is just part and parcel of what's going on because you have bad men that are in office. Let me give you a small-scale example of bad men that are in office. This uh, gentleman's name is Byron Looper. Byron Looper was um, a uh, Democrat in Georgia, and he was unsuccessful, so he moved to Tennessee, where he became a Republican, so he could actually run for office. When he was in office, he changed his name to Byron Low Tax Looper. That is, his middle name was officially changed to Low Tax, right, as he ran for office. Well, he ran against, I, now I happened to be working on a congressional campaign at the time for a guy named Walt Massey. He ran for both the Congress and the State House. He lost to us in the congressional race, but he won the State House primary. Okay, so now he was going to be running against a guy named Tommy Burks in the general election. In the general election, he was running against Tommy Burks, and uh, three weeks before the election, he drove up on Tommy Burks' shot, uh, farm, shot him and killed him, and then he was the only person on the ballot. The good people of Tennessee uh, didn't have a provision for taking his name off the ballot. So they, uh, they wrote in his widow, and he lost somehow like 30000 to uh, 1500 or something, um, and then he ended up in jail. Now, uh, the story, that's where I usually end the story. He just died in jail in June after assaulting a pregnant guard. So, I mean, I mean, this guy was just a piece of work. This is the kind of guy that's trying to get his hands on the levers of power. So you have bad people that are running for 
office. And at least in the federal government, you have things like tanks. So you put those two together and you have a pretty lethal combination. So a simple equation would be something like bad men plus an army equals oppression. And you want to not have that kind of scenario. So now in business, you play offense, right? You want to trust, you want empowerment, you want self-management in a voluntary association. You're trying to build great products and you're kind of on offense. You want to do these kind of things. In government, it's very different. You play defense. You know that you've just armed the government. So you want the rule of law, you want checks and balances, you want limits. So because the government, anything that the government does is force, you want to set the rules and restrain evil, but you also don't want them to then oppress you at the same time. Ronald Reagan said that the government big enough to give you everything you want is also big enough to take everything you've got. Even Obama has said that what Washington needs is adult supervision. And this is the guy that wanted to make government cool again. Okay. So even Obama understands that. Now, the founding fathers had a very distinct view of what leadership should look like, or let me say it like this, how they reasoned about leadership was very, very interesting. Now, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who was not at the Constitutional Convention, said, let no more be said about the confidence of men, but bind them down from mischief with the chains of the Constitution. He wasn't saying empower, make them free, have, have them have all the ability to do as much good as they could do. He wasn't saying that. He was saying exactly the opposite. Bind them down with the chains of the Constitution. Now, here, I'm going to show you anti-federalist and federalist. Both sides were rapidly opposed to each other, but they agreed on the fundamental assumptions more often than not. So here's Patrick Henry, anti-federalist. When you see red print, it's an anti-federalist. When you see blue print, this is uh, Alexander Hamilton. It's going to be a comment from a federalist. Now, in my doctoral dissertation, I looked at the assumptions. I, I traced them. And the, here's the number of comments by category, man, people, or man, the nature of man, the nature of power, the nature of people, the nature of government, the nature of society, and then the percent of those comments. And graphically, you can see what they were really concerned with. They were kind of concerned with man and people and government, but they were really concerned with power, power being abused, right? Lord Acton said, uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. The founding fathers were very, very concerned that power would be abused if it got in the hands of, well, men. Let me, let me do it like this. Here's the nature of man. Let's start with a, a syllogism. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, what do we know about Socrates? Socrates is mortal. Okay, very simple. A very common syllogism in logic. Okay? The founders reasoned, men are corrupt. All leaders are men. Not just low-tax looper. All leaders are men. Therefore, all leaders are corrupt, or at least have the propensity to be corrupt. So you got to be really, really careful. If all leaders are corrupt, how do you deal with them? That was the question that the founding fathers were going to answer. So they first talked about the universality of the nature of man. That is, everyone's in the same boat. In fact, the Germans have a, a, a really interesting phrase, something to the effect of there's a little bit of Hitler in each of us. And I think that's kind of how the founding fathers were thinking. They were thinking, yeah, you know, people can do bad things. Even a good person can do bad things in, in the right circumstances. So here's an old Whig. Now, this is a pseudonym uh, as they're writing the Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers. This is an Anti-Federalist uh, writing his newspaper comment that the only safe way of reasoning on political subjects is to consider men abstractly as men with like passion and infirmities throughout the world in every age and in every country. Wow, that, I mean, that's universality. Principles of human nature are as infallible as any mathematical calculus, right? We can depend on them. Again, Alexander Hamilton, again, we must take man as we find him, and if we expect him to serve the public, we must interest his passions in doing so. Now, the passions were like their, their catch-all psychology, the, you know, the drive of humans. We must interest them in doing so by... Um, kind of bribing them to be good. The, the depravity of man. The depravity of human nature, illustrated by examples from history, will warrant us to say, and that's how they reason from things, okay? We know that people, that, that men do bad things. And so, therefore, we're going to do this with, as we frame the system of government. Um, John Marshall, the first chief justice, those who know human nature, black as it is, they weren't saying, Hey man, it's basically good. And kumbaya, let's, let's all get together and have a hug fest. It wasn't anything like that. Okay. Uh, John DeWitt, anti-federalist and let human nature be as depraved as hell itself. And we all know it is. That's a premise to what he's about to say. Another example, Governor Livingston, indeed, if it were not for the depravity of human nature, we should stand in no need of human government at all. 
again, listen to how they're reasoning. Something's wrong internally with man. But what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. Now, they also didn't have a, uh, a view of, say, the best and brightest like we thought of in the 60s. This is, this is Kennedy's administration, or uh, this is Kennedy's uh, cabinet. I believe this picture was about the time of the Bay of Pigs invasion. Remember, they almost got us nuked. These were the smartest people in the country, and they almost got us nuked. Okay? But, sir, one thing surprises me. It's to hear the worthy gentleman insinuate that our federal rulers would undoubtedly be good men and that, therefore, we have little to fear from their being entrusted with all power. This, sir, is quite contrary to the common language of the clergy, who are continually representing man as reprobate and deceitful and that we really grow worse and worse day after day. I really believe, sir, we do. And I make no doubt to prove it before I sit down. And from the Old Testament, when I consider the man that slew the lion and the bear, and that he was a man after God's own heart, and when I consider his son, blessed with all wisdom, uh, and the errors that they fell into, I extremely doubt the infallibility of human nature. And this last uh, part of General Thompson's speech uh, really clinches it for me. When I consider the man that slew the lion and the bear, and that he was a man after God's own heart, and when I consider his son, blessed with all wisdom, he's talking about David, King David and King Solomon. He says, Sir, I suspect my own heart and I shall suspect our rulers, right? He's saying, even I don't trust myself. Something's wrong internally in me. I shall not, uh, shall not trust my rulers. Uh, James Madison said, enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm. Human nature is an ally. Human nature can be counted on because if you know that this is the way he's gonna, they're going to be, well, then how do you interest them? And the, the uh, uh, common idea was self-love. Patrick Henry, anti-federalist, said, tell me not of checks on paper, but tell me of checks founded on self-love. And again, the real uh, rock of political salvation is self-love perpetuated from age to age in every human breast and manifested in every action. All checks founded on anything but self-love will not avail. Uh, Melanchthon Smith, men who are ambitious for places will rarely be disposed to render those places unstable. That is, if people want to come to power and once they're in power, they want to do a good job. They want to, you know, have the esteem of the public. A truly ambitious man will never do this unless he's mad. Now, James Madison, if we expect to call forth useful characters, we must hold forth allurements. That is, if we really want good people in government to govern us, we must mm, kind of bribe them with something valuable, uh, power and prestige and, and maybe even a good salary. Governor Morris, quote, did not hesitate, therefore, to say that the loaves and fishes must bribe the demagogues. They must be expected, made expected, uh, I'm sorry, they must be made to expect higher offices. Right? So you're going to bribe them into good behavior. They're going to treat you right because as they treat you right, they will uh, go on and rise to bigger and bigger places of office. Now, that's how they saw the nature of man. So how do they see the nature of power? Men love power. Men, from the monarch down to the porter, are constantly aiming at power and importance, and this propensity must be as constantly guarded against in the forms of government, said the federal farmer. George Mason, those who have power in their hands will not give it up while they can retain it. On the contrary, we know that they will always, when they can, increase it. Does history abound with examples of voluntary relinquishment of power, however injurious to the community, asked the sentinel? And Agrippa said, ambition is in a governor what money is to a miser. He can never accumulate enough. The tendency of all rulers is to accumulate more and more power to themselves. Charles Pinckney, the Federalist, said, men do not easily wean themselves from power. Power is also liable to abuse. Lord Acton, we talked about earlier, he's not a founding father, he was British, said power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And this is the way that the founders thought. I hold, hold to this maxim that power was never given, of, a, of this kind especially, but it was exercised, nor ever exercised, but it was finally abused. First, said James Madison, first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. Okay? This is the way that they're thinking about power. Men are bad. Power must be guarded against because they will. Something's wrong with men, all men, right? You must guard power.
Okay, so what's the nature of the people? Well, the people are sovereign. It will not be denied that the, that all power is originally invested in the people, and that it should be exercised either immediately by themselves or immediately by the representatives. Patrick Henry said the rulers are the servants and agents of the people. The people are their masters. At Elbridge Jerry, the evils that we experience flow from the excess of democracy. The people do not want virtue. That is, they do not lack virtue. Um, the people are generally virtuous, but they are dupes of pretended patriots. Democracy, the worst of all political evils. Now, remember, we think of democracy like, yay, democracy, we all have an equal vote. But they're thinking of democracy in, in the Greek and, uh, you know, kind of experience where it became mob rule. In fact, um, you see this uh, throughout this discussion. The oppression and injustice experienced for, among us from democracy, said George Mason, or James Madison, talks about the inconveniences of democracy. They, want, they don't want just a democracy. They want representative government to kind of get us a step removed from that. Their very character was tyranny, democracies. Their very figure, deformity. Now, the virtue of the people is important. A republican or free government can only exist where the body of the people are virtuous, said the Sentinel. Had every Athenian citizen been a Socrates, every Athenian assembly would still have been a mob, said Madison. Madison wrote the Constitution. I mean, he was a, a chief architect. Sure, some things changed from his original draft, but this is the chief architect of the Constitution saying, had every Athenian been a Socrates... Every Athenian assembly would still have been a mob, so you still have to do something to, to tamp this down so it wouldn't become mob rule. So what's the nature of government? The purpose of government, therefore, at the great end of civil government is to protect the weak from the oppression of the powerful, to put every man on, uh, uh, upon the level of equal liberty. Okay, I think we can all agree that that's kind of the purpose of government. Okay, Alexander, Alexander Hamilton asked, why has government been instituted at all? Because the passions of men, because whatever is wrong inside of men, will not conform to the dictates of reason and justice without constraint. We have to constrain man. Okay, so you have to set up government to keep bad people from harming good people. Okay, the size of government, it's a maxim that government ought to be cautious not to, over, uh, not to govern over much, for when the court of power is drawn too tight, it generally proves its destruction. Governments destitute of energy, on the other hand, will ever produce anarchy. So there's a balance between the two. Principles of government are important here as well. When about forming a government, if we mistake the principles or commit any other error, the very circumstance promises that power will be abused, said Patrick Henry. Bad principles in the government, though slow, are sure in their operation and will gradually destroy it, said Alexander Hamilton. Okay, so we understand that there are principles of government that we need to calculate. What's the nature of society? Men are made for society. We may, with reverence, say that our creator designed men for society because otherwise they cannot be happy. They cannot be happy without freedom, nor freedom without security. That is, without the absence of fear, nor thus secure without society. Our wants, our talents, our affections, our passions all tell us that we were made for a state of society, but a state of society could not be supported or long ha or supported long or happily without some civil restraint. So to flourish in society, that's business, right? And to flourish in your private sector business, you need government to make sure that bad people don't rip off other people. Okay? Religious liberty and virtue also played in. Without the prevalence of Christian piety and morals, the best Republican constitution can never save us from slavery and ruin, said Charles Turner. That is, unless the people are virtuous in and of themselves, unless they start that way, the government structure is not going to last. Uh, Samuel Huntington, the Federalist, said, While the great body of freeholders are acquainted with the duties to which they owe their God, to, them, uh, to themselves and to men, they will remain free. But if ignorance and depravity should prevail, they will inevitably lead to slavery. Okay? 34% um, of the quotes that the founders uh, uh, made on the Constitutional Convention floor were directly or indirectly from the scriptures. Other things came from Blackstone and from, from John Locke and, and from other uh, sources uh, of the common law. But the lion's share, uh, this is the largest percent of any category, came right out of the scriptures. So they're th thinking from a particular worldview. So here are the findings. Um, now, in business theory, there's, uh, there's theory X and theory Y. Theory X says men are basically bad, or, or in a business setting, they're basically la lazy, and you have to control them and stay on top of them and make sure they're doing their work. And then there's theory Y. Men are basically good, and they want to work. Work is as natural as play. And, and really, this is not 
really a um, a, a legitimate uh, uh, dichotomy. Really, men are both bad and good. They're uh, from the from thinking the way that the founding fathers thought. They're made in the image of God, so they're basically good. But they're fallen into sin, so there's something wrong with them. So both parts are there, and they reason this way. So here's James Madison saying, as there is a degree of depravity in man, which requires a certain degree of circumspection and distrust. So that's the basically bad part. So there are other qualities in human nature which justify a certain portion of esteem and confidence. Okay. So the founding fathers' understanding of leadership depended on their worldview, and and the way that they saw it was that there's a balance. And but when you arm that balance, when you give them power, now you have to be really, really careful. You can't just empower and trust them. You have to be, uh, you have to, in Thomas Jefferson's words, bind them down with the chains of the Constitution. Uh, they used the carrot and the stick. Pedal Pedal Taya Webster said, personal reputation, approbation of their fellow citizens, and dread of censure and shame are strong inducements to noble and upright worthy behavior. That is, we're going to bribe them to be good governors. Okay, So is man basically good? Well, uh, George Washington seemed to think that they're not basically good. Washington wrote with emphasis, we have probably had too good an opinion of human nature in forming our confederation. That is in forming the Articles of Confederation, which required the Constitution in the first place. Because mm, the states weren't getting along and playing nice. Of course, they had very little incentive to do so. So here's that simple equation again. Remember this, bad men plus an army lead to oppression. But the founders would have tweaked it. It's not just bad men. They would have said, all men. Now, remember, it doesn't matter which political stripe you are. I mean, uh, here we have a few Republicans and a few Democrats. All men plus an army minus checks and balances would lead to oppression. So that's why the checks and balances of the Constitution are there. I, you know, having to pass legislation in one house and then go to the other house and then have the president sign it is a slow, inefficient way of doing business. But those checks are there in order to keep uh, bad men from abusing power. So why the differences and who, who's right and who's wrong? Well, there's a difference because of a few fil filters. One, the place. The place was the Constitutional Convention and the ratification debates. And what they're trying to do is get a good sense of what will, how, how can we guard people in, uh, how can we protect innocent people in the community? And then how can we protect ourselves from the innocent people? Or, or how can we protect ourselves from the people that we have just armed to protect the innocent people? The purpose is to make sure, is again, defensive. It's to make sure that our rulers don't become tyrants. And the perspective was a very um, biblical-oriented understanding of the nature of man. This was not men are basically good and they're just going to excel and spread their wings and I believe I can fly. It wasn't like that. It was very much, yes, men have a propensity to be good, but they also have something wrong within them and you have to guard against that. Um, this is a good metaphor that the gun and, and the handcuffs, we want to arm them. We want to arm these people to be, uh, to protect again, the innocent against bad people and even arrest them. But you also want to make sure that you're not willy nilly going, okay, police go out there and do all the good you can just go and, you know, shoot and arrest whoever you think is a bet. No, there, there are rules there. Remember Madison first enabled the government to control the government.